Hey guys welcome back to my channel make sure to like and subscribe and comment down below what fanfics you want to see with that out of the way let's begin chapter 18. Chapter Tex. Thankfully, the rest of the day went on without any more drama. Izuku spent the rest of the period working on training plans while Hitashi slept in his office. The session with Hitashi was interrupted by the situation with the muzzle, but it's nothing they can't discuss later. After all, the training plan for Hitashi is already practically complete in his mind. And Izuku has no doubt that his father will want to train Hitashi personally. May God have mercy on the soul of Izuku's new brother. By the way, who will be the big brother? Izuku quickly pulls out Hitashi's file iron. The lie one. Hitashi is older by just two weeks. Damn. Izuku would have liked to be the big brother. But, hey. Since he's the little brother, he can request piggyback rides, right? This is how it works, right? Well, being the little bro doesn't mean that Izuku will be any less protective of his new brother, no way. If someone tries to mess with Hitashi, they better be fireproof. It is almost time for the last bell. Which means that Izuku will have to meet Kasuki, as they said earlier. This meeting is what will make her destroy their relationship once and for all. Better just get it over with. Getting up from his desk, Izuku walks to Hitashi and gently shakes him. The purple-haired teen wakes with a startle, but relaxes when he meets Izuku's eyes, first focusing on the yellow, then on the blue. How long did I sleep? He asks, rubbing his eyes. It's been just a few hours, but his eye bags already look better. The rest of the period. Izuku replies and raises a hand to stop him from panicking. Don't worry, Tashi. You needed the rest. I'm sure you can get notes from your classmates about what you lost. And dad won't let you fall behind the class. Okay? You're right Hitashi says, taking a few breaths to calm himself. Then he registers what Zuku just said and looks up. Tashi. You don't like it? Zuku asks worriedly. I didn't mean to offend you. If you'd like, I can call some by this time is Hitashi, who raises a hand to interrupt him. It's okay, Zuku. He said, blushing slightly. I was just surprised. Nobody ever gave me a nickname other than villain. Well, they're stupid. Zuku replied. You are the villain, Tashi. I feel that I should pay in the same coin. But your name is already kind of a nickname. Hitashi said, looking at Izuku from up to down. Then he saw his restless posture, practically hopping in place, and smirked. Bunny. Bunny? Zuku's instantly went red. Why am I a bunny? If you can stop yourself from hopping in place, I can find you another nickname. Hitashi pointed. Ha ha ha. He got you, Zu. Kuzu laughed. If he's a bunny, what am I? Let me think. An asshole. This is what you are, Kuzu. Zuku mumbled. Wow, didn't know Bunny could swear. Hitashi said. And no one will believe you. Ever. Kuzu replied. He's an even bigger chaos gremlin than me, but no one believes when I say it. Zuku simply turned his head to the side and stuck his tongue out. The intended target was obvious. Why, Fox, of course. Hitashi interrupted their bantering. Fox? Kuzu asked. That's pretty fitting, actually. It's perfect. You're just as cunning as one. And slight too. Zuku said. Then they hear the bell ringing. Dismissal time. Hey Tashi. We need to take care of some business before we go home. Can you go to the teacher's lounge and tell dad that we'll be in the usual place? Zuku asked, not giving much away as to what these businesses are about. It may take a while, so I'll see you at home, okay? Okay, bunny. Hitashi replied, getting up from the couch. They left the office together, and Izuku walked Hitashi to the teacher's lounge, then went straight to his classroom. As expected, Kasuki was waiting just outside the classroom, hands in his pocket and his usual scowl on his face. They must have had pee earlier because he's also really sweaty. Hey, nerd. About fucking time. I thought you wouldn't come. He greeted, Izuku nodded at him. Follow me. They sat and started walking, refusing to elaborate. Kasuki frowned but started following him through the corridors. They walked for about 10 minutes in awkward silence on the Netsu approved labyrinth until they got to a big door. It looked like one of the gyms. Where are we? Kasuki asked as Izuku pressed a button at the door. The panel opened at the wall, and Izuku made a wait motion for Kasuki, then put his face in the retinal scanner. The door opened, and he gestured for Kasuki to follow him inside. Welcome to Field Omega. Kuzu said as they entered. Or, as I like to call it, our personal playground. What the Kasuki said, taking on the place. This place was a gift from Principal Netsu after we accepted the teaching assistant position. Every UA employee has something like this. Zuku explained. Azawa and his hell course, sniped in the range 13 of the USJ. Ground beta is technically all mites. This place has everything we need to test, analyze, and train the most problematic quirks you can imagine. Kuzu continued. All proof dummies, obstacle course, targets for short and long range, cameras everywhere, so I can analyze the footage afterward, and from various angles. You got the point. And why did you bring me here? Kasuki asked. To talk, like you wanted. Zuku replied. This place has cameras. 
but it's the only place that Netsu won't be watching unless we ask him to. But first, Izuku went to a closet and threw a change of clothes and a towel to Katsuki. That should be about your size. The showers are there, take a shower, and then we'll talk. What? Katsuki said indignantly. Are you saying that I stink? You smell like caramel, and we both know it, Katsuki. Kuzu replied. But this isn't why we are asking for you to take a shower. Just humor us this time, Katsuki. Zuku said. Please. Fine. Katsuki huffed, picking up the clothes and going to the shower. As Katsuki went to the shower, Izuku walked through the installation to pass the time. You really think this will work? Kuzu asked while they walked. It's just a theory, but you know it makes sense. Zuku replied. You always want to see the best in everyone, Katsu. Kuzu mused. I hope you're right. I wouldn't just forgive him if it is. But I'll hate him a little less. Coming from you, that is the equivalent of heavenly forgiveness. Zuku joked. Shut up bunny. After you fox. Zuku stuck out his tongue. They glared at nothing, each other, for a few seconds, then burst into laughter. After that, they waited for Katsuki in comfortable silence. A few minutes later, Katsuki came back with a towel draped on his shoulders. He seemed much calmer than before. The two stopped in front of each other. Izuku said nothing, just letting Katsuki collect his thoughts and decide what he wanted to say. The silence lasted for about five minutes, but when it was interrupted, Kuzu almost fell backward in surprise. I'm sorry, Katsuki said. But the real surprise is that he bowed to Izuku. I am sorry for how I treated you when we were children, for ruining our friendship, and for what I said the other day. I don't want you dead. I never did. Izuku kept silent for a few seconds, but Katsuki didn't look up at him, only he kept bowing. Damn it. I hate when you're right, Su. Kuzu mumbled. Raise your head, Katsuki. Don't bow to me. He said, and Katsuki got up again, studying Izuku's expression carefully. Then Kuzu unceremoniously sits down on the floor, gesturing him to follow. First things first, Zuku said. I forgive you, Katsuki. You what? Katsuki asked, confused. You too easy, Su. Kuzu said, then addressed Katsuki. Well, you never did anything unforgivable. But I'll truly believe you're sorry when you prove it. That's fair. Katsuki nodded. And fully intend to prove to you. Well, we can start by discussing something I noticed. Zuku replied. Well this in no way justifies what you did to me. I think it might not have been completely your fault, Katsuki. What do you mean? Katsuki asked. Do you remember how we were before you got your quirk? Zuku asked. You have always been harsh. But you weren't aggressive. That changed right after you got your quirk. We all know how your quirk works. Kuzu continued. You sweat nitroglycerin and ignite it causing explosions. But did you know that nitroglycerin is toxic to the human body? Of course, I know it. Katsuki replied. But my body is immune to it. Not completely. Zuku shook his head. Your quirk will kill you, that's true, but your body still recognizes it as a toxin. And when your body is exposed to a toxin, you get stressed, and the stress trigger adrenaline. The adrenaline activates your fight or flight responses. And we both know your default response is fight. Kuzu completed. The only reason you never knew that is because Aldera quirk counselors must suck. Quirk counseling was optional. Katsuki replied. I tried a few times, but I gave up. The only thing they worked on was to make my explosions stronger, and I didn't need their help for this. I didn't want to get my quirk even more volatile. I already hurt someone with it. Then they suck even more than I thought. Kuzu said. Try thinking about it for a second. Zuku ignored Kuzu's commentary. How were you feeling before showering, and how are you feeling now? I was much more irritable before. I didn't want to talk. Because I felt that I would blow if I did. Kasuki explained, then looked at his hands. You might be right. You took some anger management sessions, right? Zuku asked. What, it's all on your file. Just because dad doesn't read the students' files to avoid bias doesn't mean that I don't either. It's so fucking weird to have a teacher my age. Kasuki groaned. You'll get used. Kuzu shrugged. Anyway, back on topic. Anger management. It sucked. The hag tried several, but we couldn't find a single therapist who wasn't more interested in my quirk than my problems. Kasuki explained. Most of the techniques I use, I found on the internet. The therapists were useless. If you can give me their names later, I will do something about it. Therapy, especially related to children, is a serious business. A therapist should not be prejudiced in any way. And well, as we talked about the other day, Hound Dog is a good option. We can schedule a session for you in a few days. But it's up to you, Kuzu said. Are you afraid of trying? Afraid? Me? I'm not afraid of anything. You can schedule it for the earliest available date. I will prove to you that I can change. Kasuki replied. I still have much to make up for you. But when I'm done, I hope we can be friends again. I still hate you. Kuzu said. But I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. I am looking forward to it. Zuku smiled. And welcome back, Kakin. Kasuki's eyes widened as he looked at Izuku, then he grinned. After that, they parted ways. 
Checking his phone, there was just a message from his dad. Looks like he went with Itachi to his foster house to pick up his things. It'll probably take a few hours for them to get home. Izuku then decided to go home to prepare dinner. They're sure that Shouda and Hitashi will arrive tired and emotionally drained. Hopefully, Titsawa won't punch anyone. On the way, they pass Netsu and Majina, examining what is left of the UA barrier. Whatever destroyed the barrier surely is powerful. It was not the work of an acid, nor was it brute force. The barrier has been reduced to, literally, dust. The press has no one with the core capable of doing this, so who broke the barrier, and what did they want? Izuku has a bad feeling about this dot are you sure you want him? The woman asked for the 10th time since Shouda got there. And he's been there for less than half an hour, for God's sake. Calm down, Shouda, don't punch anyone. Don't punch anyone. Don't punch anyone. Don't punch anyone. Yes. I'm sure I want him. Shouda replied between deep breaths. Since they arrived, Shouda sent Shinsu to his room to gather his things, while Shouda went to talk with the foster parents. The moment Shouda showed he was one of UA's teachers, they instantly assumed that Shinsu was in trouble and being expelled. They said some concerning things, to say the least. These idiots aren't even trying to hide the abuse. They're sure that everyone will agree with them, and it's infuriating. The last time he felt so much like punching someone was years ago when he saw Izuku handcuffed to that hospital bed. Especially because Shouda knows that they are mostly correct. Quote discrimination is so ingrained that most people see nothing wrong with it. But to the dismay of these idiots, Shouda is not the majority. He has already been through the same thing as Shinsu, and he will never let this child go through something like that again. Forget about fostering. Bring the adoption papers yesterday. Just as the woman was about to open her mouth again. Probably to ask if Shouda is sure one more time, Shinsu opened the door and entered the room. The couple immediately tensed as the kid entered. The look in their eyes is so full of hatred and disgust that Shouda feels seconds of throwing up right here. You got everything. Shouda asked, eyeing how he had only a single bag and a small box. Not to mention his school bag that is in Shouda's car. Yes. Aigo Shinsu started saying but stopped when he saw his faster father getting up and running with his fist raised. He took a step back, throwing his hands in front of his face to protect himself. But Shouda was faster. He caught the fist and twisted in a painful angle, making the man scream in pain. If you ever raise this hand against a kid like this again, I'll make it so you can never use it again. Shouda spit, full of venom, then shoved the man backward. Let's go, Shinsu. The kid nodded, not wanting to risk saying anything, and started following Shouda. Wait. The woman called before Shouda could leave. When Shouda looked, his blood boiled again. You'll want to take this with you. And in her hands was a fucking muzzle. Don't punch anyone, Shouda. Don't punch anyone. Don't punch anyone. Don't punch anyone. I don't need that. But his cork as she tried arguing, but shut her mouth when she saw Shada's red eyes and floating hair. I know what his cork is. I'm his homeroom teacher if you already forgot. He snarled. And I'm also a pro hero. You better remember that this place will be investigated for neglect, child abuse, and cork discrimination. Then he left without sparing her another glance. Shinsu pressed a notebook in Shada's hands as soon as they entered the car. It must be the diary Izuku commented earlier. The drive home was silent. Shouda was still trying to calm down, while Shinsu didn't seem to want to say anything. Eventually, Shouda managed to calm down enough to know he wouldn't snap at anyone who didn't deserve it. So he tried to say something. Do you like cats? He tried, and it seemed like it was the right thing to say. Shinsu instantly perked up. Do you have cats? He asked hopefully. Two cats. Pablo and Bastard. Bastard? Your cat's name is Bastard. Shinsu asked, holding his laughter. You'll understand when you meet her. Shada shook his head, focusing back on the road. They didn't talk more until they got to the apartment. But fortunately, the silence wasn't awkward. After parking the car, Shada guided Shinsu to their apartment. Hitashi was nervous about this. He followed silently after Izawa, but he could have not worry. Izawa said he didn't do things he didn't mean, but used to say how long it will take for him to regret fostering Hitashi like so many others did. Hitashi can't get attached. It'll only hurt more afterward if he does. Entering the apartment, the first thing Hitashi noticed was the familiar red shoes at the entrance. A well-known fact was that duality is a false positive, previously believed to be quirkless. When Hitashi discovered that, his respect for the hero grew even more. Azawa unceremoniously kicked off his boots and entered. Hitashi followed after him but took his shoes with a bit more care and left them near Izuku's at the entrance before following. The apartment wasn't anything impressive. Not what anyone would expect from a hero's house, but exactly what anyone would expect from Azawa. A simple living room with an extremely comfy looking couch in front of a TV. The cat tower in the corner and not much decoration. The most surprising thing was the many pictures hanging on the walls. Mostly in a dark background, probably nighttime. There were mostly pictures of a tired looking Izawa and a much shorter Izuku wearing his old skull mask. You can drop your bags anywhere. I'll show you your room after dinner. 
Bathroom is the third room to the left. As Zawa explained. Then we have my room. Knock on it before entering. Izuku's room, if the sign on the door is green, you can enter. If it's red, knock. My office, I barely use it. And guest room, which from now on will be your room. Kitchen is right there. Itachi started hearing a low humming coming from where Izawa pointed. His curiosity won, and he approached it. He saw Izuku in front of the stove. He was wearing headphones and humming a familiar tune that Hitachi was trying to recognize. From the wonderful smell, he seems to be making curry. Perched on the counter beside him was a white cat watching everything intently. Hi Tashi. Izuku greeted him without turning around. He lowered the fire, then pressed a button on the headphone before taking them off. Dinner is almost done. Izuku turned around, and Hitachi saw his blue eyes as he started walking towards Hitachi. The cat jumped on his shoulder and started eyeing Hitachi suspiciously. Right, right. Zuku said, patting the cat. Tashi, this is Pablo, my cat. Pablo, this is Shinsu Hitachi, my new brother. At the word brother, the cat's gaze softened. Hitachi took a good look at the cat's face, instantly noticing the scar in his mouth made him look like he was smiling. Whoever did that to a cat, Hitachi hopes it's burning in hell for it. Carefully, Hitachi raised his hand and offered to the cat, who hesitated for a second, then nuzzled it, meowing softly. I met him less than a minute ago, but I would kill for him. Hitachi said, not taking his eyes off the cat. He'd kill for you first. Zuku replied, smiling. You're something else, Tashi. It took me weeks for Pablo to let me even get close, let alone touch him. But he already warmed to you. Then he looked at Pablo. Food's ready. Can you get bastard for me? Pablo nodded and jumped off his shoulder, running somewhere, while Zuku turned back and turned off the stove. Then he raised both his hands towards the cabinets, and plates, cups, and cutlery started floating towards the table. How convenient. Hitachi muttered in awe. I know, right? Zuku giggled. Sit down. I'll call that. Hitachi did as he said and randomly chose a chair, then sat down. A few seconds later, Zuku came back, followed by yawning Izawa and Pablo, who was carrying a small black cat in his mouth. This must be bastard. The moment the black cat was put on the floor, she looked at Hitachi, and grinned. Then she ran at him and scratched his feet, making him jump in surprise. Ouch. This is bastard's baptism. Zuku said, laughing. Everyone that enters this house must go through it. Hitachi looked under the table, and the cat was still there, licking her paws innocently. Is this why you call her bastard? He asked. Oh, Tashi. You didn't see half of it. Kruza replied. Small tip. If you have anything fragile, never let her enter your room. This is a mistake you only commit once. Zuku muttered sadly. Hitachi can feel a story here. Maybe he'll ask about it later. Anyway. Let's eat before it gets cold. Kruza said, clapping his hands. Zuku's curry is to die for. It's not that good. Zuku replied sheepishly. You and daddy can't make anything but coffee. The great coffee. Kuzu said. Agree to disagree. Zuku shrugged. During the entire C-O-N-V-E-R-S-A-T-I-A-O and Hitachi will need some time to get used to seeing a person have a whole discussion that looks like a monologue. Izawa was practically asleep in his chair. Izuku didn't even bat an eye, simply serving him a plate of curry. He did the same for Hitachi and only then served himself. Hitachi tastes the first warm spoonful of curry. Kuzu was right. This is delicious. He felt something strange on his face, his vision blurring slightly, and reached over to Chuck. To his surprise, he felt something moist in his eyes. Tears. Why am I crying? This isn't the first time I have eaten curry. It can't be the taste. I didn't cry after eating lunch rush food. So what is happening with me now? Why do I feel so happy? Izuku and Izawa were smiling softly, but none of them commented on the tears, despite clearly having noticed them. Hitachi is more than grateful for that. After dinner, Izuku shows Hitachi the guest room, his room now, and promises that they will go out and buy decorations and furniture for the room over the weekend. Frankly, just having a real bed is already more than he could ask for. And he's tried to say this, but Izuku won't budge, and Hitachi is too exhausted to argue. To his surprise, as soon as he puts his head on the pillow, he falls asleep. First time in weeks that his insomnia has not struck. And the first time in months that he doesn't have nightmares. As soon as Izuku realizes that Hitachi has slept, they silently leave the room and close the door. They find their father on the couch, grading some papers, probably from class 3A. He said something about them having to write an essay for the laws and ethics class. Izuku unceremoniously throws themselves on the sofa next to him. On a scale of 1 to 10. How bad was it? Kuzu asked. Shouta stopped his grading and pressed his palms against his eyes. A 7. Shouta replied. Yikes. It's worse than Izuku hopped. Do I want to know? Zuku asked. I'm sure you don't. Shada shook his head. But I know you will. He picked up a notebook and opened it on a random page. I only read the first page. And I already want to commit murder. Izuku took the notebook and started reading the entry. One of the kids said to the monsters that I talked. Monsters? 
Zuko wondered. Looks like this is what he calls the foster parents. Shadow replied. The father is the ogre. The mother is the witch. Zuko nodded and continued to read. I didn't talk. I know I'm not allowed to, but they don't believe me. I can't even explain that it's a lie because they don't let me talk and don't know JSL. They muzzled me again. This muzzle hurts so much, it digs on my face like claws, and it's hard to breathe. They said I'll have to wear it the entire weekend. I don't want to. This was one of the first entries, two years ago, the date indicates. The page has a few wet spots like he cried while writing. I'm hungry. But the monsters don't let me take off the muzzle, and I can't eat with it. Even without it, they never give me food. I have to sneak and pray for them not to catch me, or else they'll force me to wear the muzzle again. All this just because of my quirk. Why everyone is so afraid of my quirk? I'm not a villain. This already looks bad enough, but to Izuku's despair, it only gets worse. It's been a week since I ate anything. I dreamed of my parents again. They called me a villain and abandoned me. The ogre punched me today. I didn't even do anything. He just entered the room, saw me, and punched me in the face. Why does he hate me that much? The witch made me put my hand on a boiling water pan. Is this fun for her? They started randomly deciding to muzzle me. It doesn't matter I didn't talk. Not anymore. I overheard the monsters talking earlier. They said a new kid is moving soon. They don't have enough beds, so they'll give my bed to the new kid. Looks like I'll be sleeping on the floor again. They locked me out of the house. I found a sealed sandwich in the school trash can today. First lucky break in months. The following entry surprises Izuku more than he expected. I heard present mix program today. He was interviewing those new heroes, Ifrit and Poltergeist. They said that they don't believe in villainous quirks. That everyone can follow their dreams, no matter what they do. Never let anyone tell you that can't do it. You can do it. They said. I'll be a hero and prove to everyone I'm not a villain. This is my dream. Unfortunately, things didn't get better after that. The witch made me wash the entire kitchen using a toothbrush, my own toothbrush. I never even eat here. Is she running out of ideas? Fuck. Somehow they heard that I'm too applying to UA. I had to lie to them. They think I'm only applying to Gen Ed. They're sure I'll fail. Otherwise, they wouldn't let me try. If they know I'm trying the hero course, I don't even know what they'll do. But I'm sure I won't like it. The ogre punched me again today. Shouldn't they fear me if they are so sure I'm a villain? It makes no sense. If I grow to be a villain, wouldn't it be better for them not to be on a possible revenge list? No. Stop. Don't go there, Hitoshi. You're not a villain, and you'll never be. You'll be a hero and prove they are wrong. I can do it. I know I can. Tsuku was crying after reading it. Kuzu was boiling in anger. But this is how it has always been for them. Zuku can't offer anger, only tears. Kuzu can't offer tears, only anger. Dad. Kuzu said, closing the diary. That place I'll burn that place until there's not left. Dad simply sighed and got, gesturing for Izuku to follow him. They followed him to the rooftop of the building. No one needed to say anything. They did that many times. Nobody ever goes up there, so they can spar as much as they want. Perfect for letting out some steam, and at this moment, both Shada and Kuzu need to. They spar for a few hours, just enough to calm down, and then go to sleep. The next day, Shada and all of class want to find themselves in front of a bus, ready to leave on a field trip. The class knows that this is for special training, but they don't know exactly what. It's a surprise, after all. Rescue training, Yusche. By now it's a tradition, every class has to do in their first week. After all, it won't do for future heroes to forget what are their real duty. Heroes are too focused on flashy fights, villains, and hero rankings. But a hero's duty will forever be to protect and save. Shada admits that he slept through most of the bus ride, ignoring the conversation among the students. Upon arrival at the USJ, the first problem soon appeared in the form of Shada's number one source of headache. The idiot all might have spent all his time going after purse snatchers, and now he won't make it in time for training. Great. As always, 13 gives their speech about how the powerful quirks that could save millions of lives, could also be easily used to kill, so the kids must learn to use their quirks carefully and responsibly. Many previous classes used to ignore these concerns. But this class again showed promise. With only a few exceptions, everyone showed that they were thinking seriously about the speech. After that, they go inside, but as they enter, Izuku's phone starts ringing as they enter. Shada watches as Izuku picks up his cell phone and frowns as he looks at the number before answering. Dobby? You never call. What's happening? Dobby. The vigilante Izuku has been helping. What is happening? Dobby said something on the phone, and Izuku's eyes instantly snapped to the fountain at the center of the building. His frown morphed into a panic expression as he hung the call. Dad, we need to evacuate. Izuku said, pointing to the center. Shada followed his hand and saw a small swirling purple mass of mist. What is that? Did the training already start? Kirishima asked. The purple mass started growing, stretching from one side of the center all the way to the other. And out of it came several dozens of villains. Some that Shouda recognized and others that he didn't. 
Right in the forefront was a man early 20s, long, unkempt blue hair, bloodshot red eyes, and the person who was obviously making the portal that the villains were walking out of. Tall, dressed in a bartender suit, seemingly made entirely out of the same purple and black mist that the portal was made out of. But what was really worrying was the creature that followed the blue-haired man. A black humanoid monster with a very muscular body covered in scars. His brain was exposed on the top of his head, his large eyes around it, and a beak-like mouth with an array of sharp teeth. The creature was, for lack of a better word, terrifying. But now it's not the time to worry. Everyone, stay back. Shouta commanded, and everyone fell silent when they heard the tone. This is no training. Those are real villains. He said, falling into a battle instance. No villain will touch his students. For Izuku, receiving a call on his personal phone is already something strange. After all, the only people with his number are Class 1A, the UA staff, and a certain pair of vigilantes. Seeing Dobby's call is even more strange, as he has never called before. Not to mention that he knows about Izuku's work as a teaching assistant. In short, when Izuku answers the phone, he is confused, to say the least. Dobby? You never call, what's happening? Izuku asked as soon as he answered the call. Izuku. Finally. I don't know where you are, but you need to act now. The Lego the call started cutting yesterday, any second now portal hundreds, the call dropped. Izuku's phone was dead. Then something caught Izuku's attention at the center, by the fountain. A small purple mass started to expand quickly. Izuku called his dad as soon as he noticed. Dad, we need to evacuate. He said, pointing to the mass. Shouta followed his pointing and saw it at the same as the rest of the class. What is that? Did the training already start? Kirishima asked. The mass expanded and started looking like a portal. Dozens, maybe hundreds of villains, started coming out of it. Some known, others were unknown to Izuku. But the blue-haired man with hands on his body, the mist man, and the humanoid creature, were clearly the most dangerous of the group. Everyone, stay back. Dad commanded, the same tone he uses to direct civilians when on duty. This is no training. Those are real villains. He said, falling into a battle instance. The blue-haired man stepped forward, eyes looking for something. Where is he? He should be there. The man said, scratching his neck, then looked at the students. Where is All Might? I can't kill him if he's not there. According to the schedule you stole yesterday he should be there. The Miss Man said. Should we leave? No. If we kill a few students I'm sure he'll appear. The blue-haired man replied. This was enough to spring everyone into action. 13. Duality. Protect the students. Dad said, preparing to engage the villains. Don't you dare die on me, Eraserhead. Kuzu said. You know me better than that, Ifrit. Eraser had replied, smiling. No true hero is a one-two pony. Ifer said. We'll be back. Hang in there. With a single nod, Dad jumped down at the center, capture Scarf already in motion. Izuku didn't waste any time, passing the control to Zuku. They took flight and went after the students running for the door. But they stopped in front of the door when a mass of purple mist appeared. The mist man came from the portal. I'm sorry, but I'm not allowed to let you escape. The mist man said. We are the League of Villains, and we are here to kill All Might. Okay, but why is he telling them their plan? Are these villains so confident that they will succeed, or does this Miss Guy have other plans? And how do you expect to achieve that when All Might is not even there? Poltergeist asked, slowly moving to the front of the crowd. It doesn't matter, I have a job to do, and I'll do it. Miss Man said and started slowly spreading his are those even arms. It all looks like Miss. 13 prepared to attack, but Kirishima and Kasuki jumped towards the villain first. You should consider that you would be beaten by us before you get the chance. Kirishima sat behind the smoke screen created by Katsuki's explosion. But as the smoke dispersed, the villain didn't have a single scratch. How dangerous. I need to remember that even if you are just students, you still are UA's golden eggs. Move away, now. Ifra commanded, jumping in front of them. I'm sorry about that. But my job is to scatter you all. The black mist started expanding. Let's see if you can survive. Then he shot the mist towards the students. Ifrit opened his mouth, threw a glowing of bright green, and sent a fire wave towards the villain, but the fire disappeared as soon as it touched the mist. Then, other villains jumped out of the mist and pushed the students before entering again. By the time the mist receded, the only students left were Siro, Satu, Yuraka, Ashido, Shaoji, and Iida. Physical attacks can't hurt him, and he warped everyone. Poltergeist mumbled. Ifrit could see many portals opening around the building, which means that the students must still be there. But is completely incorporeal. He must have some physical part in his body. He started floating. 13. Evacuate the students. Yida Khan, as soon as you're out, I need you to run to the school and warn the teachers. But it would be a disgrace as the vice class rep to run and. You're not running, Yida. Ifra said. You are calling for reinforcements, which can be the difference between life and death in this situation. Now. Go. Then Poltergeist lunged for the mist guy, concentrating his telekinesis at the air around him. It's much harder to grab things that aren't physical, but it's not impossible. 
As he attacked, 13 and his students started running for the door. Ifr saw another portal forming on their way. Poltergeist, switch. He called, and they switched control. Ifr shot the grappling hook and used it to dive at high speed, fists already burning a bright blue, and he punched through the portal, just as he saw the yellow eyes of the mist man, who grunted and receded. Physical attacks don't hurt him, but he's not immune to heat. Poltergeist mumbled. Switch back. Poltergeist tried pulling on the mist, but it was too unstable to get a feel on it. Not even smoke is that hard to subdue. Glancing behind his back, he saw 13 disintegrating the door and the students leaving. You're more problematic than we thought. The mist man said. Looks like the students escaped. I must warn Shigaraki tomorrow. Then he went through another portal. Seconds before he disappeared, Poltergeist noticed some kind of metal plate attached to the mist. This must be his physical part. But before he could grab on it, the villain disappeared. Damn, it. If a curse. We lost him. He said he needed to warn Shigaraki tomorrow. Poltergeist replied. I'll bet my present Mick Plushy that this is the handyman's name. Handyman? Really? Ifra snorted. Is this the best you could think? Shut up. Poltergeist blushed. We need to go help, dad. Right on. Ifra replied, and they flew to the center where Eraserhead was engaging the villains. Villains. Of course, they're being attacked by villains on their first week. To make things worse, they were all scattered around, and Hitachi ended up in the squall zone with the bird boy and the stone boar. This is just Hitachi's curse luck again. To make matters worse, he can't help but worry about Eraserhead. He knows that the hero can handle himself, as he said, no hero is a one true pony, but still, Hitachi knows Eraserhead better than most. He is at a complete disadvantage in long battles or against many enemies. Not to mention that that creature, whatever that thing was, gave him the chills. Still, most of the villains here are easy to deal with. Tokurei Ami is taking them almost single-handedly. How can these villains be so confident they can kill All Might when they are being defeated by kids? Hey, Tokurei Ami, grab one of them for me. Hitachi asked. Understood. Tokurei Ami replied, sending Dark Shadow, who quickly grabbed one of the villains. So Dot want to tell us your plan? Hitachi asked the villain. Why would I the villain's face blanked? Let's try again. What is your plan? I don't know. The villain replied. Great. Hitachi groaned. How the villains plan to kill All Might? The creature has been brought here to fight him. Oh, great. The villains are just cannon fodder. The creature is the real problem. We need to keep going. Hitachi said. Tokoyami nodded, and Dark Shadow smashed the villain's head on the floor, knocking him out. They can do nothing to help now besides praying for Izawa, and Izuku's safety. Izuku almost choked on air when he got to the center. The creature was pinning a racer head to the ground, his arm shouldn't bend like that, and there was blood on the floor. The blue haired man was talking to the mist man. And at the pond not far from there was Asuri and Todoroki, also watching the scene. The handyman was talking angrily at the mist man. He turned his back to a racer head like he wanted to leave. But then he turned to the pond and lunged with his hand outstretched towards Asuri. Izuku immediately jumped, but he won't get there on time. The villain closes his hand around Asui's head, and nothing happens. The villain turns back to Eraserhead. You really are cool, Eraserhead. Now move. The creature raises Eraserhead's head again, and prepares to bash on the floor again. But at least Izuku is close enough to that. Before the Naomu could finish, Ifrit was on him, both feet glowing a bright purple, and drop kicks the creature that screams and drops Eraserhead. Then in a quick motion, he shots a chain and pulls the handyman from Asui. Duality. The villain says. So Sensei was right. Both dualities are the same person. Sensei. Is that? Doesn't matter, you'll die here too. Asi, Todoroki. Get a racer head and run. Ifra says and lunges towards the villain. Don't let him touch you. Asi warns him, jumping towards racer head. He disintegrated as always Sensei's elbow. Got it. Ifra replies. He stops right in front of the villain and throws a blazing punch at his gut. Ah. You brat. Your agility stat is too high. He whines, then tries to grab Izuku, who parries the attack with his arms, avoiding the fingers, and kicks him to the side of the head. The attack makes the hand on his face fall down. No, father. Izuku jumps back as the villain hurries to recover the hand. What the heck? Father. This is the hand of his father. Izuku glances around. It seems like Asui managed to get a racer head. And at some point, Kasuki and Kirishima arrive. They're holding the mist man. You'll pay for that. Now move. Izuku turns around, and before he can react, the Naomu is already punching them in the chest with enough force to throw them several meters. They collide against the wall and almost pass out right there. They sure have at least a few broken ribs for that. How is that thing moving? That kick would have killed a normal person. Ifra says. That thing is obviously not a normal person. Poltergeist replied, forcing himself to get up. He coughs blood. Damn it! I think we have a punctured lung. This will be a problem. I need to breathe to use fire. Ifra replied. Let's go. Poltergeist said, choosing to ignore the problem for now. 
He discards the mask since it's making it harder to breathe then starts floating back to the battle. We need another strategy. Holtergeist says through their shared mind since it's better than talking at this moment. Your kick didn't do anything, so it must have either super regeneration or some kind of shock absorption. Use the arrows. Ifra suggests. If it has shock absorption, we can try to pierce it. If it has super regeneration we can try to overwhelm it. Poltergeist nods and opens his cloak, floating the five arrows in front of him. He dips the arrows in the flammable solution, then Ifra puffs a small flame, lighting the arrows. He locates Tanami, who is about to attack Hiroshima, and sends three arrows that pierce through his chest and both arms. Tanami screeches, and Izuka can't see him quickly regenerate from the burns. So it really has super regeneration, in that case. Poltergeist raises both hands and sends all arrows simultaneously, piercing the creature in multiple places. But he doesn't stop at that. Moving his hands in a series of movements reminiscent of a conductor in an orchestra, the arrows keep circling the creature, constantly piercing it. The damage is consistent, but not enough to overwhelm the super regeneration. It's not working. Ifra comments. Then how about this? Poltergeist throws both grappling hooks at the creature's chest, then uses his telekinesis to wrap the creature on the chains. You can't use your fire like that. But there's plenty of fire for us to use there. Poltergeist spins in place, using the chains to throw the Naomu in the direction of the conflagration zone, then flies after the creature. This creature, who hurt his dad. Izuku doesn't hear when All Might burst through the door. There's no Zuku and Kuzu. For a moment, they don't feel each other. Izuku feels the anger burning into them. They feel the tears in their eyes, both at the same time. They didn't feel anything like this since their quirk manifested. But now is not the time to think about this. Izuku stops right above the Naomu and kicks him with all his force in the exposed brain, releasing the chains and sending the creature crashing through the ceiling to the floor. But they aren't done yet. Izuku raises both arms, crossing them in front of their chest, and screams. Hellfire and takes control of all the fire in the zone. As the fire starts gathering, they change color to a bright purple and spin like a tornado around the Naomu. Izuku keeps it for at least 5 minutes before releasing it. The fire dies as soon as it's released. The Naomu, or what remained of him, is on the floor. If it can regenerate from this, it'll take some time. Izuku starts coughing blood again and falls to the ground. He passes out before hitting the floor. Zuku is not sure how long it took for him to wake up. But when he does, it's too hard monitor beeping annoyingly at his ears. He really doesn't need that now, not with the headache he's feeling at this moment. Where is he? And why? Oh, right. Villains attacked the USJ, and they fought that creature. Is everyone alright? 13. The students. Toshi. God, is his dad okay? Zuku practically jumps from the bed before feeling a pain in his chest. He looks around and finds himself in a hospital room. A window reveals that it is already night. But that's not important now. He needs to find his family. Make sure they are safe. Nothing else matters right now. Wow. Izuku, calm down. Someone said, putting a hand on his shoulder. Zuku grabs the hand, snapping his head towards the person, and he sees a familiar mop of purple gravity-defying hair. Tashi. He whispers, gently letting go of the hand. Are you okay? Hitashi starts laughing. I'm not the one in a hospital bed, Bunny. He says. Everyone is okay, Sue. The only ones hurt in the attack were you and Izawa-sensei. He's right there. Hitashi points to a bed right next to Zuku's, where a person resembling a mummy is lying. He's pretty banged, but the doctor said he won't suffer any permanent damage. Zuku lets out a relieved sigh. Dad is hurt, but he'll be fine. Everyone else is fine too. That's great news. He looks like a mummy. He hears coming from his own mouth. Kuzu. When did you wake up? Zuku asks. Two minutes ago. Kuzu replies. I was about to try to calm you down when Tashi started talking. Then he turns to Hitashi. What about the villains? The thugs were mostly caught. Hitashi explained. The creature was also caught. The mist guy and the hands guy escaped. The heroes arrived not long after you dragged that thing away from the center. Everyone saw the purple tornado. Izuku nods and keeps silent for a few seconds. Hey Tashi. Could you bring me a water cup? Zuku asks. Okay. Be right back. Hitashi replies and leaves the room. As soon as Hitashi leaves, Kuzu sighs and asks. How can you even breathe like that? Not sure, better not to question. His dad replies. How bad was it really? You died for two minutes. Shout replies, completely serious. The doctors had to perform an urgent surgery. I take it, you didn't tell Tashi. Zuku sighed. Guess it's for the better. Something happened, dad. What do you mean? Do you remember our tests with our quirk? Zuku asked. Moving fire with my quirk is the most I can do. I can control the heat, but I need to be touching the fire for that. Kuzu complimented. But when we fought the Naomi, we controlled all the fire in the conflagration zone. Kuzu raised his left hand, Zuku raised his right. I think. It was only for a few minutes. Zuku continued. But I'm sure I felt anger. We became one again. 
Kuzu said. I'm sure of it. We'll figure out what happened to Zuku. Shada assured. I promise you. I know. They replied together. What about the school? We'll have two days of break. Shada explained. So we'll be back Monday. Your only injuries were the broken ribs and punctured lung, so you should be discharged in the morning. Then we'll go home. I'm sure you won't be discharged just yet, Dad. No. But they can't trap me here. Shada replied. If his face were visible, Izuku is sure he would be smirking. Sometimes I wonder who is really the kid here. Zuku muttered. I'm back. Tashi said, entering the room with a glass of water, which Zuku graciously floated towards himself. Thanks Tashi. He smiled then down the glass. He hadn't noticed how thirsty he was until now. With Tashi back, Izuku and Shada dropped the heavy subjects since they didn't want to worry the kid. It took some convincing, but eventually, even the insomniac surrendered to exhaustion and fell asleep. The next day, first thing in the morning, Sukauchi entered their room. Nothing surprising since he probably would want to get Izuku's statement about the incident. The surprising part was seeing a black-haired, scarred man following the detective into the room. Dabi entered without any ceremony, like he wasn't a wanted vigilante, and sat down in the chair in front of Izuku's bed. Tashi Izuku called, and the purple-haired boy nodded. I'll wait outside. Then he left the room. I would say I'm surprised. But I'm not. Zuku said, I'm Tsukauchi. Hi, Himi-chan. Hi, Zuzu. Tsukauchi replied in a downright bizarre tone to hear coming from him. Hi, Eraser-chan. His dad didn't reply. Instead, he kept pretending to be asleep. As much as I would love to hear how Himi-chan got Sukunko's blood. I'm sure you didn't come here to that. Kuzu said. What do you know? Yesterday, the League approached us again. Dabi started explaining. They wanted us to help on the attack, but we refused again. Tsukauchi's face started melting until a familiar blonde hat became visible. They were so mean. Shigya wouldn't even let me stab anyone. Himiko pouted. And they didn't let us leave until they were about to attack. Then she transformed back. As soon as we left, I called you. But it was too late. Dabi sighed. What the fuck? They heard coming from the door. Hitashi was there with another Tsukauchi, the real one this time, alternating between the two Tsukauchis in the room. Do you have a twin? I can assure you that I don't have a twin. Tsukauchi replied. And I would love to know when you got my blood, Himiko. Hi, Tsuchan. Himiko said, dropping the transformation completely. Tsuku lifted a finger, throwing his dad's capture weapon around Hitashi's eyes. Himi-chan. He said, looking to the ceiling. Tell me you brought your clothes this time. Oops. She giggled. Transform yourself into me, please. I refuse to continue this conversation until you get dressed. Zuku said. Tashi, I'll explain this later. Alright Hitashi said, sounding completely weirded out. I'll be right there if anyone needs me or don't. Then he left again, not even bothering to take the scarf off his eyes. After he left, everyone eyed each other for a few seconds. Then Kuzu shrugged and looked back at Dobby while Himiko transformed into him. Sakauchi mumbled something about needing coffee. Anyway, Kuzu said. Sakonko, you know these two. Dobby was telling me what he discovered about the League of Villains. Dobby sighed, then resumed his explanation. Their attack failed. But I'm sure they won't be giving up anytime soon. He said, then pulled a few pictures from his coat. For now, they only have three real members. Shigaraki Tamura is the leader. He pointed to the photo of the blue-haired man from the attack without the hands covering his face. Kurajiri acts like his caretaker. He pointed to the missed man. And the last one is the one Shigaraki calls Sensei, but he never showed his face. He points to the picture of the monitor. I heard him talking to Shigaraki well with them, but he only talks through this monitor. Oh, and this Sensei is the one that made the Naomi thing. Himiko chirps in. I heard they saying that it is completely brain dead, and only obeys what Shigi tells it to do. They brought it to fight All Might, Zuku said. But I don't think super regeneration would be enough to defeat the symbol of peace. Super regeneration, shock absorption, super strength, and super speed. Dobby corrects. For someone who was dealing with one of the biggest informants in the underworld, you would imagine that Shigaraki would be careful what he shows me. But no, he bragged non-stop about the thing yesterday. Multiple quirks. Zuku almost jumped. How is it even possible? Damn, All Might. You said he was dead. Tsukauchi muttered. Who's dead? Kuzu asked. I need to make a call. Tsukauchi said, getting up. Rest for now, Izuku. Then he went for the door. You too, Eraser. Shada only grunted in response. It's better if we leave too. Dobby said, getting up. But I have one more thing for you. He pulled one more envelope from his coat and gave it to Izuku. He'll change location again soon. But there are two possible cities that he'll move to next. Thanks Dobby. Izuku smiled, but his eyes didn't leave the envelope. A single word was written on it. Stendhal. I'll find you soon. Hitashi is still trying to understand what the hell happened earlier. No one seemed surprised but him, so whoever this girl who had turned into the detective was, they knew her. When he asked Izuku, he simply said she was a friend. 
Fortunately, this was the only strange event of the day. As Izawa predicted, Izuku was discharged not long after, with strict guidelines to avoid any kind of physical activity for at least another three days. Izawa should stay in the hospital for at least one more day. But after Izuku promised to keep an eye on him, the underground hero was eventually discharged as well. The fact that he threatened to escape through the window also helped. Anyway, they went home, and the rest of the day was spent with them taking a nap on the couch. Pablo hasn't left Izuku's side since they got home. It is more than evident how attached the cat is to the boy. Izuku had neither the motivation, nor the condition, to cook, so they ended up ordering food for delivery. And after dinner, Izuku decided to gather everyone in the living room to watch a video. Within the first few seconds, Hitashi already recognized the video. It was the recording of the second day of class when Izawa basically threatened the symbol of peace. Izawa had a completely done with everything look on his face. All Might didn't lose his smile, but it was evident that he was cold sweating under the glare. The camera moved towards the teachers, and a few murmurs could be heard in the background. Young Izawa. I'm sure they'll be fine. All Might tried to argue. They're hero students. First year's hero students, All Might Izawa replied. They're yet to have a single lesson in core control and safety measures. You want to randomly throw them to face each other, in a closed space. And you're sure they'll be fine. The third years do this exercise, and even so they can't avoid a few accidents, you moron. Young Isa. Call me young Izawa one more time, and I'll break your arm. Izawa snapped. All might actually shiver at this. Izawa. He said carefully. Everything is under control. Izawa huffed, his expression torn between tired, angry, and completely done. Then he saw the students, looked directly at the camera, and to everyone's shock, he grinned. Izuku started laughing, and Hitoshi looked at him. It's time for a logical ruse. Kuzu said. Very well. Izawa addressed the students. You'll follow his planned lesson, since he's so sure it's safe. It'll be All Might started, but Izawa cut him. And since everything's safe, let's make a compromise. Izawa said. For every student who has to go to the infirmary, I will break one of your fingers. Yan Izawa glared, and All Might chalked on air. Izawa isn't this a bit. Everything is safe, right? Izawa asked but didn't let him answer. Then there's nothing to fear. Carry on with your lesson. I'll be just observing. He went closer and said in the most menacing voice everyone ever heard coming from him. Closely. The video cut a few seconds later. Izuku was wheezing like a tea kettle. Dad. Kuzu said, looking at Izawa. Never change. You know me, Kuzu. Izawa grinned. After watching the video at the time, it was scary. But seeing it now, Hitashi agrees that it was hilarious. The rest of the afternoon became a movie session. Specifically, Disney and Pixar after Hitashi admitted that he had never seen any of their movies. Which, according to Zuku, is unacceptable. Wally, Finding Nemo, Lion King, Brother Bear. They watch these movies and some others. And Hitashi reluctantly admits that he loved every one of them. They continued the session until, in the middle of Frozen, Hitashi fell asleep. The next day he woke up in his bed dot because of the muzzle problem, followed by the alarm and the attack on the USJ. Izuku and Hitashi could not have the same discussion Izuku had with the other students. So they decided to have it now since today is Saturday, and Izuku can't go back on patrol for at least two more days. Shortly after breakfast, Izuku and Hitashi meet in Izuku's room. Izuku sitting on his bed, the notebook with the purple cat floating in front of his face. Hitashi sitting right in front of him. Alright, Tashi. Izuku started. Let's start with your costume. The inspiration is obvious, after all it is the same as mine. Dad is incredible. And is expected, simple, practical, functional. I would say, perfect. He didn't ask for any support gear. Why? Kuzu asked. I didn't know what to ask for. Hitashi replied. Normal. Most first years don't know what to ask for. Statistically speaking, less than 20% finished the course without making some major change in costume and or support here. Zuku said, tracing his pencil through the notebook. Then he showed the sketch to Tashi. I can think of two items that might help you. First, persona cords. He showed a sketch of a mouth mask. Simply put, this device will disguise your voice and also allow you to imitate other people's voices. But let's leave that one for later. Kuzu said, turning the page. You may have noticed the similarity of this mask to a certain object that I am sure you don't want to use again. So until you have had a few therapy sessions, best to avoid any potential triggers. Therapy? Hitashi asked. Kuzu closed the notebook and raised an eyebrow at Hitashi. Yes, therapy, Tashi. Zuku said gently. What you went through, both in your life and at USJ, was something traumatic. Because of the USJ, all students will be required to attend at least one session with the hound dog. Kuzu explained. After that it is their choice. But remember one thing, Tashi. Therapy does not make you weak. Zuku said. Since dad adopted us. We go to therapy weekly. It helped us learn to cope with many of our problems. Kuzu continued. You don't have to continue if it doesn't work. 
but could you at least try? Itachi thought for a few seconds, alternating his focus between the blue and the yellow eye. Then he nodded slowly. Okay, I'll try. Tsuku jumped and hugged him. Thanks Tashi. This is all I asked for. Then he opened the notebook again. On another note. I think you will like this one. He showed a sketch of a catcher scarf, the same type as his dad uses. What do you think? A catcher scarf. Hitachi's eyes practically shone under his eye bags. I tried one of these once. But I have zero talent with this thing. Zuku said. My chains work much better. But you, Tashi. I think you will do well with one of these. I'll ask dad to help you with it later. Kuzu said. I think he can help you with more than this though. What do you mean? With all due respect Tashi. But you are a stick with legs. Kuzu replied. I am not saying this to offend you. It is impossible to build muscle mass when you are actively being starved and can't leave the house for anything. It's not your fault and I know how hard you worked for your chance. But this doesn't change the fact that you will need to stay on the same level as the others. The difference is that we will support you. Zuku continued. We have to develop a training routine for you. Ours is enviable for you. Kuzu said. Our training is focused on muscle mass, as Zuku takes care of our mobility. But in your case, it's good to keep the muscles at a level that doesn't compromise your mobility. Unless you want an all might physique. Itachi frowned, and Kuzu started laughing. You? No, thanks. As expected. Zuku laughed. I would suggest gymnastics and or dancing too. It helps with flexibility. I don't think I would be a good dancer. Hitashi replied. I didn't think so either. But nowadays nobody beats me at breakdancing. Kuzu replied. It is especially useful for incorporating kicks into my fighting style. Really? Hitashi asked. Actually, I didn't have any chance to see you really fighting. What is your style? Close courts. Uncomfortably close. Kuzu replied. In short, I get as close as possible. That way I can stop attacks before they even start. You notice that I'm relatively compact. That's one to put it. Hitashi chuckled. Oh, shut up. Not everyone can be a giant. Kuzu replied. Anyway, that means that most villains have a reach advantage over me. But from the moment I'm in their face, that advantage becomes a disadvantage. It's like using a spear against a sword, if the swordsman gets close enough, the advantage of the spear is completely lost. I think I get it. Hitashi nodded. It works because of our short stature. But it won't work for you. Zuku said. As for what will work for you. Kuzu smirked. I think I have a few ideas. If you're open to try them. Hitashi mimicked the smirk, and they started planning. Monday came faster than expected, bringing Shouda and Izuku back to the UA. They were waiting in the teacher's lounge, although Izuku had to go to the infirmary for a checkup with her recovery girl before class. If all is well, she will heal the rest of his wounds. As Shouda reviewed his lesson plan for the day, the door opened, revealing the big idiot, All Might, who entered the room in his powered up form despite everyone there knowing his true form. The clueless buffoon basically didn't notice all the professors staring daggers at him and just walked in, pulling the subject with his usual smile. At their desk, Izuku held one of their notebooks so tightly that the hardcover was beginning to bend. Good morning everyone. All Might said, going to his desk, where he sat down and deflated. It was a tragedy what happened. But fortunately everyone is fine. Terrible words. Izuku slammed their notebook down hard on the table, got up, and walked over to All Might's desk. Good morning All Might. Do you mind buffing up for a second? Kuzu said, smiling sweetly. Okay? All Might said, confused but obliged. What the? A punching sound echoed in the room. Everyone turned their heads and saw Izuku with their clenched fists slammed to All Might's cheek. Then Shouta noticed the blue eyes. All Might is screwed. Most people fear a lecture from Kuzu, but the one they should fear always has been Zuku. There's something really terrifying in being lectured by someone that can't get angry no matter what. It just means that his arguments will never be clouded by anger. This, in addition to his expression of I'm not angry, just disappointed never fails to bring guilt even in supervillains. Everyone is fine you say. Zuku said calmly. Dad almost lost his vision and his quirk. Can you repeat that to his face? He pointed to himself. I died for two minutes. Can you repeat that to my face? Asuri was almost disintegrated. Can you repeat that to her face? Can you repeat that for all the students who had to fight for their lives much sooner than they should have for the simple fact that you don't take your work seriously? His tone of voice did not change for even a second. Yang A's All Might tried, but Zuka raised a hand to stop him, then his eyes turned yellow. How's your search for a successor going, All Might? Kuzu asked, and All Might coughed blood. What? The time you spend working has been gradually decreasing. Then, a few years ago, you came to Misatafu and settled here. And now you have become a teacher in the biggest school for heroes in Japan. Your time limit was the only piece I was missing, and after finding out, your plans became obvious. He waved his hand dismissively. So I will ask again. How's your search for a successor going? Did you find any candidates? Well, Izuku slammed his hands on the desk. To hell with the answer. You're a teacher, All Might. 
The moment you accepted the position, you committed yourself to be a mentor to all the future heroes that will come out of here. You have many enemies, and the moment you accepted this position, all the students gained a target on their backs. So the least you could do is to take your position seriously. Teach the students what it is to be a real hero. If you can even remember what it is. And be here to protect them in case something like this happens again. Then he started leaving the room. I'm going to recovery girl, see you in class, dad. He left massaging his wrist. Damn it, Kuzu. Did you really have to punch so hard? It's like his face is made of steel. Shouta would have found the scene hilarious if he was not also furious with the hero. Still, he managed to feel proud of what his son had just done. If you would have the spine to say something like that to the face of the number one hero. At least the idiot had the decency to look guilty after hearing the lecture. All Might, please come to my office. Nedzu's voice came from the speaker. If All Might looked ashamed before, now he looks terrified. He gets up and leaves the room looking like a prisoner going to the execution chamber. Serves him right. Shouta is not a vindictive person. I mean, yes, he is. But at least this time, everyone agrees that All Might deserves whatever will happen to him. Jan Kenpo. Izuku yelled, pulling scissors on his left hand and rock on his right. Damn. Zuku mumbled. Alright, so let's use my energy. He sat down at one of the infirmary beds, and recovery girl kissed his cheek. The pain he was still feeling in his chest dimmed, as did his energy. As Zuku started yawning, Kuzu assumed control. Thanks granny. He said, smiling at the old lady. I have no idea how much Netsu pays you. But it is not enough. Can't say you're wrong dear. She sighed. I wish Netsu was a little less paranoid with his staff. I could really use some help here. Maybe you could try Zuku yawned. Scouting some students for a work study I know healing quirks are rare, but you never know when you'll find someone why. He fell asleep. Kuzu chuckled. But I think it's a good idea. Even if there's no one with healing quirks, you might find someone interested in medicine. You bring a good point, Sunny. I'll bring this up with Netsu at our next meeting. She said, giving Kuzu a few gummies. Now, go on. And don't forget to have your dad come here after class. We need to do three more sessions to finish his healing. Yes ma'am. Kuzu saluted, then left the room. As he approaches the classroom, Izuku soon hears the commotion. Homeroom started five minutes ago, and it seems that the room is already making their opinion evident about Shouta being back in his state. Not that Kuzu disagrees with them, but his father is so stubborn that what's the point of even trying? Just before Kuzu opens the door, the sudden silence indicates they have received a Shouta glare, something Kuzu wanted to be inside to see what it looks like with Shouta covered in bandages. A red-eyed mummy is something he had never imagined. Opening the door to the classroom was like opening the gates to the land of chaos. If the students were worried about Shouta, the moment Izuku opened the door, it was as if everyone was holding back from jumping on him. In Dark Shadow's case, he didn't hold back and jumped up to hug Izuku. And there goes another 10 minutes spent calming the students down yes, he is fine. No, he doesn't need any more rest time. Recovery girl has already cleared him only then Shouta can explain what happens now. You all did very well with what happened, but the fight is not over yet. And with that, the tension in the class doubled. The sports festival will take place in one month and chaos started again. Is it impossible for this class not to explode after every announcement Shouta makes? Probably. Well, to preserve his dad's eyes, he shouldn't be using his quirk, Kuzu decides to test one of Suku's ideas. He knows that he can spew fire from his entire body, including his eyes. Kuzu puts his hands on the table and does his best imitation of a Shouta glare, while concentrating his flames in his eyes. The expected effect is achieved, and everyone immediately becomes quite successful experiment. He smiles and puts his hand in his dad's scarf, where he knows he keeps his eye drops. Letting fire out of your eyes can be intimidating, but drying the water from inside the eyes is not pleasant. Is that how you feel every time you use erasure, dad? Kuzu says, dripping the eye drops into his eyes. Very unpleasant. You get used to it. Shouta waved him off. No one will address how scary that was. Kaminari asked. I prefer Sensei's glares. All the students nodded in acknowledgement. Back to the sports festival. Shouta said. The school board decided to keep the festival despite the protests of some teachers. Myself included. And me. Kuzu replied. But what can we do? To ensure the safety of the students, some precautions will be taken. The festival is being postponed by two weeks to give the students more time to prepare. In addition the usual security will be increased fivefold. So the only thing you have to worry about is training as much as possible. Shouta explained. Remember, the sports festival is the perfect opportunity to catch the eye of the pro heroes and secure internships, Kuzu said. Of course, not everyone will be able to make good impressions, and we also have those who want to go underground. For those, I guarantee that you will also have internship opportunities. But regardless of your plans, go beyond. Plus Alter. The class shared with him, and the bell signaled the end of homeroom. After that, classes went on as usual. 
nothing much happened during the day, which is good, both the students and the teachers deserve a rest after what they have been through. Apparently, there was some commotion in front of the room at snack time. But if something serious had happened, Tashi would have warned them. Zuku woke up near the last period. After class, Izuku, Shouta, Tashi, and Chiyo go to Field Omega to perform some tests. Well, Tashi is there because he wanted to wait for Izuku and Shouta, instead of going home alone. And Granny Chiyo because she's the only one who knows how to operate the mind scanner they need to use. The tests are simple. After calibrating the machine, Zuku does a few simple movements. Kuzu repeats them. Then Zuku does other movements while Kuzu has overall control, and then Kuzu does the same. They have done these tests before. Well, Sunny. Nothing has changed since the last scan. Your brain continues the same. Granny said, looking at his brain waves. Whatever happened, it seems to have been only temporary. That's honestly a relief. Izuku doesn't know what they would do if they were in danger of merging again. Their dual personalities are already so ingrained that they have no desire to become one again. Do you think you can reproduce? Shada asked them. I can't tell. We don't know what exactly was the trigger. Zuku said. Clearly it had something to do with the villains. I remember that I was furious with that creature for hurting you like that. Kuzu explained. I had forgotten what it was like to feel anger. But seeing you like that was like seeing mom in that chair again. Except that instead of going into shock, this time I attacked. Zuku said. Some kind of trauma response maybe. That is what separated us, could it meet your us again? It makes sense, but how could we possibly test Kuzu's eyes slid to the kid in the corner of the room, ignoring the conversation for his cell phone. Tashi. Tashi jumped and looked at them in surprise. He wasn't expecting to be called. Problem children. Shadow warned. You don't intend to ask him to force you into a PTSD attack, do you? That was the plan, but it didn't seem like Shadow would let them try. Still, this is a perfect moment to test some theories. Don't worry. Kuzu waved as Tashi approached. Hey Tashi. Ever wondered how your core code affects someone like us? No? Tashi replied. Then let's try now. Brainwash me. Kuzu said. Also, let's talk about this name later. Er, okay. Kuzu. Righty Kuzu's eye and focus. Interesting. Zuku said. So he's under your control, but I'm still fine. Does this mean that your cork recognizes us as two separate individuals? Then he flicks his own forehead. Ha, neat. Kuzu said as he snapped out of the mind control. Looks like we are your natural counter, Tashi. Well, it is an interesting reaction, but why test this now? Tashi asked. Because we need your help to test something else. Zuku gave a summarized explanation of what happened at the USJ. We want to know if you can force us to do it again. Is it safe? What if you can't split up again? I doubt that this is the case. Kuzu shrugs. If we took that risk something would have changed the first time. If you are sure. Tashi takes a deep breath. Are you ready? I? They say together, and their face instantly blank. It's the second time Zuku feels it. He has so many tests he wants to do. What are the limits of his quirk? What counts as an answer? Would a nonverbal response work? Does a grunt a groan count? What if the person says something, but it is directed at someone else? Alright, I'm in control. What do I tell them to do? Tashi looks at Shouta. Keep the command simple, tell them to merge. Shouta replies without taking his eyes off of Zuku. Okay. Tashi turns to the duo again. Zuku, Kuzu, merge. Izuku doesn't move or do any action for a few seconds. Which leads Tashi to think it didn't work, but then Chiyu gasps, and when Tashi turns to her, she is watching the device in her hands with full attention. It happens quickly. The moment they hear the command, they both retreat into the depths of their minds. Then Zuku finds himself in a different place, a large empty white room. Automatically, he starts walking, and he sees another person coming toward him. Yellow-eyed Izuku, moving just like him. The two of them stop facing each other, just like looking in a mirror. The two raise their arms and approach each other. The moment their fingers touch, they find themselves back at Field Omega. One second, Zuku and Kuzu could sense each other normally. In the next, the constant presence disappeared, but at the same time continued. Izuku knew he was alone, but he didn't feel alone. What a strange feeling. It had been so long since they had felt complete like this. Focusing outside, he notices Shouta and Tashi staring at him with surprised expressions. Tashi pulls out his cell phone and takes a picture of Izuku's face. A few seconds later, Izuku feels his mind being released, and then it is as if something pulls him violently in two opposite directions. The feeling disappears as quickly as it appeared, and Zuku and Kuzu begin to feel each other again. Well, this was something. Kuzu mumbles. Are you okay, Zu? I'm fine, don't worry. Zuku shakes his head. A little disoriented, but nothing serious. Well, Sunny. This was definitely something. Granny Chiyo said, showing them the scanner. Izuku clearly remembers the results the scanner always showed them. Izuku's mind is divided into three sectors. The right sector is where Izuku is. The left sector is where Kuzu is. And in the center is like a communal room. 
The person in control of the body is in the center sector, and both can't be there simultaneously. Izuku constantly has two signs active in his mind, representing Zuku and Kuzu. But what Granny Chiyo showed them was different. The moment Tashi gave the command, the two signals headed for the central sector of the mind, and as soon as the signals touched, they merged together. When Tashi released their minds, the two signs repelled each other back, each to their own sector. Which explains the feeling they felt after the separation. Wow. Zuku mumbled. It's like our minds refuse to unite again. But it can be done. Kuzu added. We did at the USJ. And it lasted longer than now. Zuku continued. We will have to practice. We can start trying to go to that place again. It's a good start. Zuku nodded. But of course, this will have to be fitted in between patrols and classes. Starting tomorrow, Izuku starts the after-school training sessions with the students. And they have one month to prepare them for the sports festival. Tokoyami is the first, and he has a great darkness to overcome. Tuesday after class, Izuku didn't waste a second. As soon as the class was released, they practically grabbed Tokoyami's arm and dragged him to Field Omega. Call them over eager if you want, but they have a lot to work on, and only four weeks until the sports festival. If they can't finish everything by the sports festival, it's not a problem. But after the festival comes the week of internships, and the sports festival is the student's big chance to get the attention of a good hero. Izuku wants to give them the best chance possible. Pleasantries apart, they cut straight to the chase. The first thing Izuku needs is to better understand how Dark Shadow works, and for this, they have some questions prepared. So, Tokoyami Khan. The first thing I need to know is. Izuku started. How many times have you two lost control? And how does it feel when it happens? To a lesser degree, too many times to keep score. Tokoyami explained. But we lost ourselves completely only once. It was horrible. Dark Shadow chirped in. After losing control, we don't remember what happened. I just remember being extremely angry with something. For me, it was as if I had lost consciousness. My vision darkened. I could hear as if I were underwater. When I came to, I only had my surroundings to guess what had happened. Everything was destroyed, and my father passed out in front of me. Tokoyami explained worryingly coldly. Izuku made a note for later and nodded. Okay, and how long does a rampage last? Until some light source stops us. Or until I pass out from cork exhaustion. Whichever happens first. Tokoyami said. The darker, the bigger and stronger dark shadow gets. But he uses proportionally more energy. And is he dangerous? Zuku asks, careful with his hoarding. To you, I mean. I would never hurt, Fumi. Dark shadow squeaks indignantly. Stop, dark shadow. Tokoyami chides the quirk, then turns back to Zuku. He never hurt me physically. The only damage he ever caused me was exhaustion, but it would be wrong to blame him for that. That's good to know. Zuku smiles at them. This means that even when he loses control, Dark Shadow is still loyal to Tokoyami. Maybe he's not as uncontrollable as they seem to think. Alright, Tokoyami, we'll need to perform a test here. Kuzu said, exchanging control with Zuku. I want you to let Dark Shadow lose, so we can see how he gets when he loses control. You what Tokoyami asks worriedly, his eyes widening calmly. Kuzu almost starts to laugh, but his concern is to reassure his student. Calm down, and look there. Kuzu said, pointing down to a separate room. This is the control room. From inside we can control everything in the training camp. From the dummies to the intensity of the lights. Before starting the training, I need to know what we are dealing with. You won't hurt anyone, Tokoyami-kun. Zuku reassured. We promise you. Tokoyami hesitated for a few more minutes, but eventually, he nodded. Zuku beamed and gestured to the locker room. Five minutes later, Tokoyami was in his PE uniform, and Izuku was in the control room, both ready to start. Okay, Tokoyami. Izuku's voice echoed through the loudspeakers in the gym. Summon the dark shadow. We will do it as follows. The cameras were all pointed at him. Ten different monitors showed the room from various angles in the control room, all focused on the Tokoyami. I will dim the lights little by little, and try to pinpoint the moment when your control slips. Keep calm and remember. You won't hurt anyone. Tokoyami nodded, and a few seconds later, the shadow crow was in front of him. Izuku slowly slid the light level control knob down, paying full attention to the cameras. They observed Dark Shadow's size increasing in proportion to the decrease in light. The growth is apparently exponential rather than linear. But is light really the only factor in his growth? The moment when Dark Shadow's eyes turned red is the moment when Izuku was sure that he was no longer in control. Tokoyami's eyes lost focus as if unconscious, yet he was still standing. A few seconds later, Dark Shadow wrapped itself around Tokoyami like an armor, covering most of his features. Izuku watched for a minute, but neither Tokoyami nor Dark Shadow moved. Interesting. Izuku pressed a button, and from a secret entrance, one of the one-pointers from the entrance exam entered the arena. In a second, a head made of shadows turned toward the robot, and a talon larger than him smashed him to the ground. Interesting. 
Kuza cackled, not unlike Netsu, and pressed several other buttons, releasing all sorts of robots, moving dummies and targets into the arena. I think we had too many tea parties with Netsu-san. Zuku muttered. Every robot and dummy that moved was instantly attacked by the quirk, but the immobile targets were not touched except as collateral damage. With each target that appears, Dark Shadow shouts something almost indistinguishable before attacking. But Izuku can pick up a few words like small fry stay away hurt and fuming. Together these words form an interesting mental picture, to say the least. After about 10 minutes of non-stop attacking, Dark Shadow begins to slow down, his size also decreases slightly, but it doesn't seem to be from exhaustion. Watching more closely, Izuku noticed that he had stopped shouting so loudly, and his attacks seemed much less vicious. He continues to destroy any robot that approaches him, but now he's not attacking everything that moves. While Kuzu watched and commented on what he saw, Izuku quickly wrote everything down in his notebook. Finally, having observed everything he could, Izuku slowly turned the lights back on, noticing that the moment Tokoyami seemed to regain his consciousness, the light was lower than when he lost it. Unlike his usual enthusiasm, Dark Shadow seemed much more tamed. Tokoyami was panting, but otherwise, he just looked confused by all the robot wrecks around him. Zuku excitedly jumped back into the arena to share his remarks. But what he saw here, he has a good theory about the workings of the Dark Shadow. Well, Tokoyami-kun. I have a good idea what to do now. Zuku grinned, giving Dark Shadow an apple. From what I observed, your quirk works like this. Tell me if this makes sense. He took the notebook and started reading his theory. Dark Shadow absorbs emotions. Especially those that Tokoyami rejects. These emotions are strengthened by the darkness. The emotions Tokoyami suppresses the most are anger and fear. These two emotions together cause Dark Shadow to attack everything that moves in a frenzy, in an attempt to protect his master from the dangerous and hated enemy. Tokoyami's reason for losing consciousness during the frenzy is mental protection. This way, he is not completely exposed to such high levels of anger that it would overflow onto him. The rejection is unconscious, so neither of them ever noticed. And that is why Tokoyami shows so little emotion all the time. By the end of the explanation, Tokoyami seemed to be in shock. But this is understandable after all he had just discovered. That makes sense. Tokoyami said, exchanging glances with Dark Shadow. You always show the emotions that I lack. Am I stealing your emotions? Dark Shadow asked softly. No, you're not. Kuzu said. You two are kinda like us. The two looked at Kuzu in surprise. We never explained this to the class, Kuzu. Zuku chuckled. Our emotions are separate and shared at the same time. He explained. For example, I'm incapable of feeling anger. So no matter how angry Kuzu is, I am not affected. But shared emotions do affect us when at extreme levels. Kuzu continued. The first time Pablo, our cat, let Zuku pet him, he was so happy that I almost started dancing with him. In your case, you started to suppress your emotions very early, right? Your parents didn't like it very much when you cried, did they? Zuku asked. No, they didn't. Tokoyami confirmed. Even when they were there, Dark Shadow was the one who was always with me. And obviously, his emotional support did not improve in foster care at all. In other words, you have always learned that emotions are unwanted, but a child who represses his emotions will always end up with a breakdown. In your case, it was the first time you lost control. Zuku sighed. Frankly, how can a parent treat their own son this way? Anger and fear. These are the emotions that you suppress the most. Kuzu said. We gathered that from Dark Shadow's reaction during the frenzy. He kept yelling things like small fry. Stay away from Fumi. And you won't hurt Fumi. Zuku made his best impression of the shadow bird. Fear and anger together make the dark shadow extremely overprotective. Darkness amplifies him in all factors, which includes the emotional. The result. Zuku pointed to the robot's remains scattered. He'll attack anything that moves. That's so much Tokoyami said, exasperated. What do we do now? First course of action. Therapy. Zuku said. You have practically 15 years of bad habits to undo. You need to learn to accept your emotions. Hound dog stores are always open. Kuzu said. But if you prefer, the UA has a list of approved psychologists. They all have their background intensively checked for any hint of discrimination or prejudice. But the final choice will always be yours. Apart from the mandatory session because of the USJ, you only continue if you want to. We will think. Tokoyami said, scratching Dark Shadow's head. If you want to continue with Hound Dog, just talk to him after your session. But if you want to try another psychologist, just talk to Izawa, and he will give you the list. He also has partial custody of all his students, so he can approve whatever you need. Zuku explained. And finally, at least once a month, I advise you to book one of the gyms and go there to let off steam. You may have noticed that Dark Shadow seems a lot calmer. Letting off some of his pent-up emotions certainly helped him. Tokoyami nodded. Now, back to your training. Kuzu clapped. The best we can do at the moment is to work slowly on your limits. Just as we did today, we will lower the light levels slowly. 
Zuku explained. We stop when you start to lose control and train like this until you master yourselves. In doing so, we gradually raise your limits until the point where darkness is no longer a problem. What a mad banquet of darkness. Tokoyami muttered under his breath. But he didn't seem opposed to the idea, just a bit reluctant. We also suggest you add a support item to your costume, Kruzu said. You need some backup for an eventual emergency. Something that can generate light and calm the dark shadow. A simple flashlight would help, but we can be creative with this. And last but not least, you need to train your body. Zuku continued. Your biggest weakness is how much you depend on dark shadow. If someone can get past it, you are finished. This part is not our specialty. I will leave this training to dad. Tokoyami slightly called at the mention of Izawa. A single week and most of the class already feared shouted that much, and he just had to expel one student. That's a new record. I'll let you know when we can start. After all, dad will want to train some others. I will probably announce it to the class during homeroom in a week or two. Anyone who is interested in more than welcome to join, but expect at least four people along with you. Who will they be? Zuku smirked. Surprisey. Now, we have another half hour to train, so why don't we start now? Kuzu said. Let's start with the basics. Sit down and concentrate on Dark Shadow and his emotions. Try to feel them and pull them back to you. Focus on the simpler ones first. Under Izuku's direction, Tokoyami spent the rest of the training trying to follow instructions and feel his emotions. They didn't get very far, but any progress is progress. Well that is it for now make sure to like and subscribe and comment what fanfics you want to see later.